Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages. We're here today for episode 27 of Buford Pusser, The Other Story. Today's guest will be Dennis Hathcock, and he's going to relate to us what happened the night before the alleged ambush. So stay tuned. Okay, as promised, I've got Dennis Hathcock here with us today. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what happened the evening before the uh, alleged ambush. So, Dennis, welcome, and uh, let's get started. What can you tell me about why you were uh, following Buford that night? Well, lack of sense is one thing, but me and Johnny, uh, 16 years old, we we were kind of bored, not doing anything. So we 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 followed Buford. Oh, several times, you know. Oh, yeah. But, oh, what was the particular reason that night? Uh, I've always understood it to be something about a girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it was a girl that I grew up with, literally, from the time I was like, three or four years old, where we had grown up. I'd, somebody told me she was going with Buford, and I, I didn't believe it. I asked her. She said, oh, no, 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 no. And uh, now in my so book, I kept hearing. I refer to uh, this girl as Lady A because that is correct. she's living uh, and uh, I don't want to get her unnecessarily uh, right. a lot of attention that she might not want. Well, you know, we still speak to each other and everything, you know. But, uh yeah, I, like I said, it wasn't a romantic thing, you know. It's just she wasn't, but about two years, three years older than me. See, so. well, and um, what happened that night? Uh, where did it all start? Well, like, like I said, me and Johnny watched what happens two or three times, and uh, they would meet at midnight, and uh, they would meet at that little park that was at Eastview. It was a little old state park. And they would go through this process. She'd pull in, park, then he'd pull in. I mean, go around it and make sure nobody wasn't around, then pull in. And they'd sit there and talk, and one of them would get in the car with the other, usually. But that particular night, she pulled in and was waiting on him to pull up beside her, and he did. And we could hear him tell her, say, get out of here, and I mean right now. Now, as I, I understand said, it, this was a state, uh, this part was a uh, state maintenance lot with uh, no. gravel and things like that? Well, right beside it right. was a state maintenance lot. It wasn't part of the park, but it was uh, right beside it. Now, where were you at the time that you could see all this? Well, there was a huge pile of chirp rock that was probably 30 feet high and uh we'd climb up it and sit on on top of it and we could watch and see everything going on and and you could hear every word they said uh, so uh at any rate uh that night was a little different from other nights in that right. uh, they didn't stay together right then no no he that told her to go out there and uh i mean you could tell he was about halfway mad or something when he said said it. But anyway, she took off, and as she went to leave, she almost hit a car head on coming out of that little park. They, met, they stopped, turned, and uh, that car came on into the park. She turned and went back toward Selma. Well, the car that came in to the park Went over there under a little old real dim mercury light, turned, backed up, and Pusser had already backed in under that light. So they were had their trunks, you know, even with each other. The guy in the the car that came in with Oklahoma tags on it, uh, opened the trunk on his, Pusser got out and opened the trunk on his. And they took two, I 
you know, I couldn't identify the guns, but they were two long guns. Uh, one of them looked kind of like a military rifle, and the other one, the best I can remember, looked kind of like a shotgun or something. Anyway, they put them over in the other car. Okay. And- Didn't say nothing, Hart. Closed the doors. The car that was the the car I didn't know who was uh, took off and headed right across into Raymer. Buford, he took off and headed back towards Selma. Now, as I understand it, though, while you were there, uh, Johnny wrote down the tag number of that car. Right, right. Johnny mm-hmm. wrote down the tag number on it. It was an Oklahoma tag. I remember it was white and red. And I don't know what he did with that paper that he wrote it on. Uh, It was just a match book cover or something that he had with him and wrote it down. As I understand it from other sources that he gave uh, that to his dad and what his dad did. Right. I don't know. Um, Right. Of course, we're talking about Johnny Harrison, a friend of yours. Right, right. As a matter of fact, over here in this uh, photo, yeah. the next morning, there's a picture of uh, you and Johnny standing there with investigators looking at everything. That, that is correct. Okay. Uh, okay, so Lady A has already gone towards Selmer. After the gun exchange, well, then Buford does the same thing, heads towards Selmer. Right. And so what happened John- then? We jump on the motorcycle and decide we're going to go to Selma. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I thought that that's probably where he was going up the, to to her, where she started. They may have already have agreed to meet there. I don't know. I don't, can't. I, I can't. I don't know that part. But anyway, we got up in the cemetery that was the cemetery. There is very real high. And uh, you can get in a certain place there, and I could see everything going on at her house and at the two houses across the street from her, which belonged to her dad, and they were rental houses. Well, when we got there, Pusser had already pulled in, but he had pulled in over at the, one of the rental houses. Yeah, now let, let me say... Uh... Uh, just for clarification, the house that she went to, I'll just use the, uh, I, like I did in my book, I'll just say it was Big Star's house. Right. And tell us a little bit about Big Star. Well, Big Star uh, was uh, Petey Plunk's uh, love. I'll, I'll put it that way. And uh, the one that lived in the other house was Jim Moffitt's. You know, uh, they had a little three thing, uh, you know, Lady A was going with Pusser. uh, But apparently, uh, like I said, he, when we got there and got hid up there, where was that? He was going around the house and beating on it and saying, let me in, let me in. I guess they'd lock the door on him or something. I don't know why. But, I mean, he walked, go to one end of it and be and say, let me in, let me in. Come back to – and then he – I guess they let him in because at the front of the house, you couldn't see the very front at the door from where we were. But we didn't hear from him, now, didn't hear him hollering anymore. What, now, at, at some point, uh, as I understand it, Buford takes – uh, Lady A from the house. Tell us about that. Well, I, you know, all we, like I said, you couldn't see the front, but all at once was watching and we saw him walking out in, out in the front of, uh, of the house. You could see enough in the road. He was in the road there by the car. And she, he grabbed her arm and was pulling, trying to uh, pull her toward that car. And she broke away from him and started running. And the house that they lived in, that was across the street from Big Star and them, 
there was a door at the very end of it that went right straight into her bedroom. And that's where she was running, trying to get to. And she ran in and, from what I understand, ran in and got in the house and locked it. Okay. And he got in the car. He made a step or two toward it. And then he turned around, came back to the car, jumped in it. It was a headed north on the street and uh, took off wide open, squalling tires and uh, all that, you know, and... Uh, did he appear right. angry when when he didn't uh, get what he wanted with Lady A? Did he appear to uh, be angry at that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it wasn't unusual for him to want to show out squall tires and all that. Okay. He ran up to the end of the street, turned around, came back down through there wide open. When he got right there between the two, he locked the brakes down on it and slid the car. Yeah, all that crazy stuff. Anyway, then he went on. I told Johnny, I said, well, let's let's see where I, he, and I really thought he would probably go, was going to Adamsville or wherever. Now, let me, let, when, me, let, let me interrupt you and ask you about what time this was. Uh, I don't know, probably, probably be between 12, 30 or 45 and one o'clock okay. in the morning. So where did he so, go after he left uh, uh, that area? Well, when you leave there, you go up a hill and there's a red light there. And at the red light, when you go out through that red light, you could see all the way through Selma and we could see his car down at Phillips 66, which was a service station that was open 24 hours there. So I run down through there with my motorcycle, cut the switch, cut the switch off, let it coast. We coasted down there. My turn, we got on the back street. We coasted down there, got to where we could get right up, right across the street from there. And uh, we was standing there watching, and he and he was still talking to uh, Shorty McDaniel. That was a guy that worked there. They were standing there talking. Then he went inside, went to the restroom, and came out. And as you come out of the restrooms there, there was a po like a podium there, where. They signed, wrote service tickets, and they had a, their telephone was on that podium. He walks over and picks the phone up, makes a call. One on there, but a very little time. Takes the phone, puts it down, and to it, there was a a uh, pad, just a blank pad there that had you had. Philip 66 on, and he wrote something down on that pad. I don't know what he wrote. Uh, do you, you don't have any idea who he was speaking with on the phone? I have no idea. Okay. Uh, now, he after, goes back at, huh? after, after uh, he wrote something down on a pad, what did he do? He goes back out through it to his car, only that. And, he folds a white handkerchief that he, which if you ever watched him very much, he did it all the time. He folded this white handkerchief and went in and laid it up against the hump in the floorboard for his, by the accelerator. And I guess it's cause his foot, I don't know, I guess he had a big foot anyway, and it, I guess he, that was to keep it from wearing the carpet out there or something. I don't know why he would do that, but he did all the time. And uh, like I said, Shorty was trying to talk to him. He didn't, you could tell, he didn't want to talk to Shorty. And when he took off, again, wide open, sideways, you know, and going across that bridge there in Selma and headed right over to Adamsville. Okay, and is that and, is that the point where you and Johnny quit following him? That's the point where we quit. We did 
walk inside and look at that path. But I guess he tore it off. You know, the sheet and uh, there wasn't any writing on it. Anyway, we headed home. Johnny got in his car that was at my grandmother and granddaddy's. I go in and go to sleep. Johnny heads back home, I guess goes to sleep. Johnny lived in Selma. So that's uh, about it. Went, you wouldn't hear anything until the next morning when Johnny gave you a call. Now, I'm right. going to point out here's a photo of you and Johnny along with investigators the next morning at the uh, ambush sites. That's right. And uh, we're going to save that for another episode because there's something I want to put in here in the middle. And uh, we want to get into a conversation about uh, LaVon and uh, Ward Moore, the coroner, about uh, 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 things that occurred at the Puzzle residence that night. And then I'll pick up with you in another episode uh, where we talk about you and Johnny speaking on the phone and what happened after that, you know, because it's really interesting. Right. You have to have all the parts to the story and put right. them together to really understand what all was going on. I mean, uh, uh, what happened at Eastview, what happened in Selmer, uh, you know, the ambush sites, what happened at uh, Adamsville is very, very right. important about what uh, uh, LaVon Plunk said that she heard and uh, what Ward Moore had to say about uh, that night, because it all kind of ties all this together. And gives us a better idea, a better picture of what uh, was about to happen. At any rate, Dennis, I appreciate you being here. Um, here, I guess, uh, week after next, I'll have you back. Okay. And, uh, we'll uh, tell more of this story and as we put it all together for people. Well, like I said, LaVon's part will tie it all well, together. Before I go, let me ask you about that. Uh, I know that she told several people what happened uh man her uh she would live on after that i i don't really know if we're doing it before that but uh, she would go up to skeet Catherine's club and she told skeets he that was one of the owners and i'd sit up there and talk to her sometimes and she'd if you ever she'd start talking about that after she drank a little bit. Yeah. And uh big tears had come in her eyes. And, uh, you know, everybody says, Well, why didn't she go tell somebody? Well, she was married to Petey Plunk and uh That was one of the deputies. Yeah, yeah. And I think he had told her that if she didn't want to wind up like Pauline. Yeah. That's, That's something that we'll get into in another episode. So let's save that for a little later. But Dennis, appreciate you being here. Like I say, Glad we'll, to do it. we'll be doing this again. So uh, uh, this next episode that uh, I'm going to have is a follow-up to what happened here. Right. And uh, it's going to be, uh, oh, like I say, about what? Well, Coroner Ward Moore saw and heard that day and what uh, LaVon had to say about the uh, uh, hours right before the ambush. So, Dennis, we'll catch you next time. Okay. All right. All See right. you later. Appreciate you being here. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I'm glad everybody could join me today. I hope you enjoyed the uh, video. The next two weeks are really going to be good because we're going to be getting into things regarding the hours just prior to the ambush itself. Uh, next week, I plan to play some excerpts from interviews I did with LaVon Plunk, uh, share what I learned uh, from uh, stories that Diane Vance would tell friends. Uh, and of course, I did a couple of interviews with McNary County Coroner Ward Moore, and I intend to share some of what I learned from him. At any rate, I cover all this in my book, Buford Pusser, The Other Story. It's available at Amazon.com. Uh, it's a good way to get the story back in order, in chronological order. And when you do that, telling this story is, you know, kind of difficult because there are so many people who live their own parts in the story. And each part is just a dot in the overall story. But it's connecting those dots 
that make the story more understandable and that's what the book does that's what i hope these videos do so uh you know if you'd like to sit down read it chronological order uh the book is at amazon.com buford pusser the other story and i also wanted to mention that in may the buford pusser festival is coming up in adamsville i do urge everybody to uh, attend uh, it's a good time i've been there several times myself uh while i may not personally agree with the story that they tell buford was their hometown hero and you know uh, you can't blame them for wanting to believe in the legend even though uh, you know i know it's not not true but still yeah you'll have a good time i'm sure the local merchants would appreciate your being there uh it's it's, it's just something to you know really enjoy so until then I'll be back next week. We'll talk about Levon, Ward Moore, Diane Vance. Week after that, we'll have Dennis back and tell what he saw and uh, his interactions with the TBI right after uh, the ambush took place. And until then, You've just remember mail. what Buford would mail. say. Uh, what's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. And it doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm.